an authorized biography of La Titania called the Titania Shires and Rita. Um, we are going to chant our prayers to Sri Prabhupada and Acharya so they bless him. So we can understand um, more about the teachings and the past times of the Lord. We can serve him better. And I also pray for all of your blessings so that I can do justice to this class. Om Jnana Jmirandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chakshurin Militam Yena Sazme Shri Guru Venama Shri Shaitanya Manobhishtam Sapitam Yena Bhutale Vaya Mupakadama Yam Dati Svapadantitam Sama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pitarine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pakshati Deshadarine so this chapter 22 is titled Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, we will recall that um, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had been preaching to some great Mayavad sannyasis in the area called uh, Benares, which is today Varanasi in India. And these sannyasis were quite famous um, for their um, understanding of Vedanta, which was purely rooted in a personal philosophy. So Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had convinced them with um, authorities of Sarah and um, wonderful explanations as to what Vedanta really is, right? Specifically, of course, that Vedanta philosophy um, is explained according to the Srimad Bhagavatam, and that all these truths are contained in the holy name. We remember that the sannyasis were particularly um, critical of Lord Chaitanya and his ecstatic chanting and dancing, and they considered this sentimentalism. They had no idea that one who can chant the holy names in ecstasy has the understanding of everything that the holy name contains, which is actually all knowledge. So once they had appreciated these points by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, um, they had met the Lord again when he was on Sankirtan in Varanasi, and they had approached him, specifically Prakashananda Saraswati, to explain more about the Vedanta. And this is what this um, chapter has been about about how the teachings of Vedanta are contained in the Holy Name and the Srimad Bhagavatam and the relationship between the two, as well as the relationship between other mantras, like the Gayatri Mantra, which are actually also explanations of the Holy Name and are in, therefore, the same um, category as Srimad Bhagavatam, which is also explanation of the Holy Name. So let's chant our invocation before we get into today's class proper. Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya, Jaya Nityananda, Jaya Jaya Shri Jaya Gaurav Bhakta Vrinda, Jai Jai Shri Chaitanya, Jai Nityananda, Jai Vaiti Sancha Jai, Gora Bhakta Vrinda, Jai Jai Shri Chaitanya, Jai Nityananda, Jai Vaiti Sancha Jai, Gora Bhakta Vrinda. And the translation is, Glory to Shri Chaitanya and Nityananda, Glory to Advaiti Sandra, Glory to all the devotees of Sri Gora, Lord Chaitanya. This invocation is from Lord Chaitanya Shri Chaitanya, verse 18 of the first chapter. So, Last week, we had said that um, the OM, which we know as um, a symbol that is also um, vibrated as the sound OM, is actually the incarnation of the Lord. And it is represented by three letters in particular, A, U, and M. So OM is actually the famous Lama Mantra, the holy names of the Lord. Um, and that um, both are actually referred to as Omkar. Right. And all of these are actually Krishna's incarnations in sound. Right. Um, Krishna is actually present within these names. And along with Krishna, all his energy. Right. Sri Prabhupada said that Krishna is never alone. All his energies are there. They always serve him. And the sum total of existence is Krishna and his energy. Okay. Um, so we will um, summarize what we once discussed uh, a few chapters back about what um, those three letters actually um, symbolized, right, in terms of Krishna and his energies, um, which Sri Prabhupada actually explains in the purport of um, Sajjana Shajramita Adi Lila, chapter 7, 6, 1, 28. Omkar is a combination of the letters A, U, and M. Um, the letter A refers to Krishna, the master of all living entities and planets, material and spiritual. He is the supreme leader. The letter U indicates Srimati Radharani, the pleasure potency of Krishna, and M indicates the living entity of Jiva. Right, so that means that Om is the complete combination of Krishna, his potency, and his eternal servitors. Right? And of course, we understand that the relationship between Krishna and his energies, okay, the spiritual energy of Radharani and her expansions and us, 
uh, the innumerable jivas who are the marginal energies, right? The relationship between Krishna and his energies is one of service. That's what connects us to him. Um, in other words, Omkar represents Krishna, his name, fame, pastimes, entourage, expansions, devotees, potencies, and everything else pertaining to him. And like we said, since everything rests on him, Om or Omkar or the holy names of Krishna contain everything in existence. As Chaitanya Mahaprabhu states in the present verse of Chaitanya Saratamrita, Sarva Vishvadhama, Omkar is the resting place of everything, just as Krishna is the resting place of everything. Brahmano hi pratishta. Okay. So the problem, of course, is that we can't understand the potency and the power of the holy name, right? In the contaminated stage of consciousness that we're in, we don't actually have an understanding of the great power of what we're chanting. But those who are spiritually pure, they are able to understand it. So when Krishna enlightened um, Lord Brahma, who is of course very spiritually advanced at the beginning of time, um, he um, blew his uh, beautiful flute and the, the sound that emerged was his holy name, Om, Om, Tara. Those holy names entered into Brahma's ears and he understood everything that was in them. Okay? And because of that, he had all the knowledge that he needed to create the universe. So we'll recap that he needed to realize the purpose of the universe before he created it, of course. And the purpose of the universe is to help the living entities develop their relationship of service with Krishna so that they can be reinstated um, in their original position in the spiritual world. So all of this, of course, we can understand is contained in the holy name <clears throat> because the holy names are an explanation of our relationship to the Lord and, and of course, the relationship of everything. So Brahma, with this um, enlightenment, was able to continue his service of creating um, the world and also in passing on this knowledge because once one receives spiritual knowledge, one has a duty to pass that knowledge on. So he spoke his understanding of what he had heard as what is called the Gayatri Mantra. Right? So the Gayatri Mantra basically emerged from Brahma as an explanation of what he had heard in the Holy Name. So this is the way of receiving spiritual knowledge. One um, hears attentively after serving the spiritual master, the teacher, right? the same way Brahma had um, heard from his teacher, the Supreme Lord himself. And then one realizes that knowledge, right? One actually has to understand it and internalize it and live it, okay? And when one realizes that knowledge, one then transmits that knowledge, right? Along um, with that realization, but the realization is in line with what one has been taught. The realization is never deviates from um, the teachings of the spiritual master, which of course are all coming from the Supreme Lord himself. That means that the knowledge is preserved the way it is. And because of that, what Brahma had spoken, the Gayatri Mantra, was essentially then the same in meaning as the holy name of Krishna, and because it has, has passed uh, through Brahma's realization unchanged. This is very important. Right? Um, Prabhupada explains that you must realize um, the knowledge, but it must be in line with what we have been taught in order to preserve the meaning. So what's the importance of preserving the meaning? All this knowledge that's coming from Krishna is Krishna. Anything that comes from him is him, right? And that means that the knowledge has the ability to liberate us in the same way that um, Krishna has the ability to liberate us. Krishna is actually the only one who can offer liberation. That's why he's called Mukunda. There's no one else who can actually offer liberation. The knowledge that has been given by Krishna Right. Knowledge has been given in all the forms by Krishna. The Vedas, the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is about Krishna. Um, the Bhagavad Gita has been given by Krishna. All this knowledge is there to help us get liberated. Because like we said, it's in congruency with the purpose of this world, which is there to liberate us also. So that said, the power of that knowledge to liberate us will remain so as long as the message is unchanged as it comes from Krishna. If the message changes, then it's not Krishna anymore, right? It has been contaminated by the speculation of the, the speaker or the author. And as such, it can't grant us the same ability that that transcendental knowledge can. There's some other purpose behind it, whatever it is that the speaker is trying to achieve, maybe whatever the reader wants to get out of it, but it's not going to be liberated. So that's the importance of us um, making sure that we stay faithful to the meaning of the Lord um, as received through our acharyas. Okay. So we see then that the Gayatri Mantra um, is also um, 
preserving the meaning of the holy name. Therefore, the Gayatri Mantra um, is, also, is um, faithful to the holy name. Um, and it means that any text, any sound, any knowledge that is faithful to the holy name, to the meaning contained therein, is also Krishna. You know? um, it is the power, actually, of the knowledge received from Krishna, transmitted through um, the disciples' discussion, that can actually basically spiritualize the form of the receiver, okay, like it did with Lord Brahma, that they can actually transmit then the Lord. Essentially, that's what Brahma did. Right? In his Gaishya Mantra, he's transmitting the Lord. He's able to do that because he became a transparent fire medium, Prabhupada describes. He becomes a, a spiritualized body that is able to transmit directly what comes in to him from the Lord and out through him um, from the, by the Lord's mercy, right, through his realization. And this is what um, we are actually aiming to become. When we are such conduits of the message of the Supreme Lord, then we can deliver him to others. Okay, when, when we deliver him to others, then he can transform them as well. And so it goes on like this. This is how we can be a part of his um, transcendental plan to, uh, to rescue all the living entities by means of this material world. Um, so besides revealing to Brahma right, the truth of everything in his holy name, right, in the sound of his flute, the Lord also explained to Brahma the truth of everything in four essential verses. These verses are called the Chatur Shloki, and these verses are the actual heart of the Sriman Bhagavatam. The Sriman Bhagavatam um, was, uh, was spoken around these four verses. So as the Lord gave those verses to Brahma, and then Brahma realized them and transmitted them to his students as they will read, and more of these transcendental um, realizations that were, as we said, in line with the original meaning of those four verses were added on until we have um, the Bhagavatam today, which is 18,000 verses. All of these verses are essentially the same as the original four verses because they're all, again, congruent to the same philosophy. And since those original four verses are explanations of the truth contained in the Holy Name, the entire Shrimad Bhagavatam as a whole is an explanation of the Holy Name and therefore is the Holy Name. And therefore we say, that the Srimad Bhagavatam is a literary, a literary form of the Lord Himself. In the Shrimad, in the Bhagavatam, there are four verses written in this connection, and these were explained to Brahma by Lord Krishna Himself. So we're going to just recap this bit briefly. So we said that Om is a statement of reality, basically. Okay, it contains everything, the Supreme Lord and all His energy. That sound emanated from Krishna um, as the incarnation, and it was received to to, through the flute of the Lord right, by Brahma. Brahma understood all this knowledge that was contained in the holy name and he spoke it as the Gayatri Mantra that is an explanation of um, the, uh, the sound that he heard right? the Om, the Omkar the Lord's holy names in the flute and then the Lord further explained that explanation of um, the holy name that is the Gayatri in these four verses to Brahma. Okay. So basically these four verses, the own, the dietary, they are the same. And the explanations on those four verses, the entire Srimad Bhagavatam, the thousands of verses, same. Okay. Um the Brahma then passed on this knowledge, these four verses, to his disciples. In his turn, Brahma explained them to Narada and Narada explained them to Vyasadeva. In this way, the purport of the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam has come down through disciples' discussion. It is not that anyone and everyone can make his own foolish commentary on the Vedanta Sutra and mislead his readers. So, like we said, um, the Srimad Bhagavatam is received um, as it was from the teacher, was realized by the disciple and then passed it on. Um, it means that we can actually expand the Lord's name, form, qualities, and past tense as we realize it, as you said, as long as it's realized in an authorized way, um, in line with what our teachers teach us, because Krishna is unlimited. So it's not surprising that there's 18,000 verses. We could have millions of verses. The important thing is that it must be authorized, that it must be in line with what the Lord wants, so that knowledge could actually be of value, of spiritual value to deliver us. 
spirituality is not like what it's been made out to be today. That it can be anything random, tarot card reading, uh, astral travel, whatever it is. Spirituality has to elevate one beyond this world. Right? If this world is material, spirituality has to be of a spiritual world. Okay, It means it must be transcendental. Anything of this world cannot just be construed as spiritual because somebody puts a label on it. So it, it is related to Krishna and is truly in line with what he wants us to understand, then it is spiritual. Then it has the quality of being able to elevate us out of this world. Um, so this knowledge has been passed on in this way to preserve its spiritual quality. To Brahma, to Narada Muni, to Shri Vyasadeva, all the way down to um, our Acharya, to Shri Prabhupada, to Shri to Sal Sal. Krishna also spoke to Arjuna and the Bhagavad Gita, we remember. Um, that it was passed on with the aim of liberation. Okay, there was no other motivation. Krishna wasn't trying to be clever. A lot of people sometimes, unfortunately, because of their contaminated consciousness, trying to make him out to be some kind of politician, you know, who had his own agendas in getting Arjuna to fight, which is terribly offensive mentality, right? Um, and no other teacher in the lines of disciples' discussion had any other motivation, such as wealth or followers to be um, remembered in history to get points or degrees in this modern age. The uh, aim is always to help the living entities develop their relationship with the Lord and get out of this material world. And this is, this is um, the urgency of these teachings and preserving them as they are. Okay, this, is actually, um, this is actually the aim of everything. This is why Sri Prabhupada called it the highest welfare work to preserve this knowledge and to make sure that um, it is received as it was given. Sorry, it is given as it was received. Anyone who wants to understand the Vedanta Sutra must read Srimad Bhagavatam carefully. Right? Um, under the instructions of Narada Muni, Vyasadeva compiled Srimad Bhagavatam with the purpose of explaining the aphorisms of Vedanta Sutra. So this is how these two are related. Right? Um, in writing Srimad Bhagavatam, Vyasadeva collected all the essence of the Upanishads, the purport of which was also explained in the Vedanta Sutra. Srimad Bhagavatam is thus the essence of all Vedic knowledge. That which is stated in the Upanishads and restated in the Vedanta Sutra is explained very nicely in Srimad Bhagavatam. Now, of course, all these scriptures have to be related because they're all coming from the Supreme Lord. When Brahma understood um, transcendental knowledge from the Lord, when he was enlightened by the Lord speaking to him, while saying his truth, he was able to speak that as the Vedas. He also received the four verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam and he was also able to transmit that to his disciples. So all this knowledge is going to have the same aim. We said it's all supposed to help us to develop our relationship with the Lord and to get out of this material world. So there is no difference between the Vedas and between the Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, when Srila Vyasadeva was recording the Vedas, he took the essence out of it um, in the Upanishads and the essence of that in the Vedanta Sutra. And when um, his spiritual master expressed dissatisfaction that he was not directly addressing devotional service to the Lord, then um, Narada Muni explained um, these four verses of Srimad Bhagavatam to um, Srila Vyasadeva as he had heard it, as Narada had heard it. And then when Srila Vyasadeva was able to understand these um, four verses, right, the Srimad Bhagavatam in its core, in its nutshell, then he was able to actually relate the two, that those verses are a commentary on what the Vedanta is actually saying, explained in a course a personal thing because those four verses speak of Krishna as a person, he speaks as a person, right? Aham he uses this word, he's this word repeatedly in those four verses to emphasize that everything that all the other knowledge was actually speaking about is me. And right? people trying to interpret it in different ways, trying to make it more impersonal in particular. But all that Vedic knowledge that you know has been taught is all about me. Okay, this is quite clear. In the Srimad Bhagavatam. So the way to understand Vedanta is to understand it through Srimad Bhagavatam. This is how Srila Vyasadeva actually designed it. Um, the interesting thing, of course, is that even though Srila Vyasadeva is Krishna, the one who actually gave us all that knowledge, he didn't write his own um, interpretation, some new interpretation. He received it faithfully from Narada Muni and he expressed it faithfully. And this is him setting the example of being a perfect um, disciple as well as perfect teacher. He's transmitting it as he receives it. Okay. Um, 
that means that anybody else who um, is able to do that is actually able to give Krishna to others. Okay. Um, unfortunately, there are still some people out of envy that are not able to accept that Krishna is speaking about himself directly in those four verses. Um, there are people who will say that the Shrimad Bhagavatam is not exactly congruent with um, the Vedic scriptures, that it is a different kind of history. And in that regard, we can see that um, these statements of Vedanta, which are basically just one line of origin, have been expanded in the Shrimad Bhagavatam. Um, we gave the example a few classes back about the second aphorism of Vedanta Sutra, which states Janadi Asiyasaha. That um, aphorism is explained in the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam quite extensively um, because the translation is, of course, that the Brahman, right, the translation from Vedanta Sutra is that Brahman is the source of everything. And um, the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam elaborates on who this Brahman actually is and how he is the source of everything. Krishna. So like that, there are many statements throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam that are explaining the orism of Vedanta very clearly, along um, with the philosophy that Krishna gave Sama. And Shri gives us another example here um, with relation to the Ishapanishad, which is one of the Upanishads. So we said that um, the Upanishads are explaining um, the essence of the Vedas, and the Vedanta is explaining the essence of the Upanishad, and Srimad Bhagavatam explains the essence of Vedanta. And now we have a comparison between the Ishapanishad and the Srimad Bhagavatam. Right? There is a verse in the Ishapanishad similar to one found in Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, the verse in Ishapanishad is the first verse, and the verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam is in Canto 8, chapter 1, page 10, which states that whatever one sees in the cosmic manifestation is but the Supreme Lord's energy and is non different from him. Consequently, he is the controller, friend, and maintainer. All living we should live by the mercy of God and take only those things which are allotted to us according to our particular living condition. In this way, by not encroaching on another property, one can enjoy life. So, what is this verse from Sri Ishapanishad? Isha Vashya Midam Sarvam Yatinsha Jagatyam Jagat Ena Yaktena Bunjita Magritaha Kashya Shitanam. Translation is, everything animate or inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. One should therefore accept only those things necessary for himself which are set aside at his post. And one should not accept other things knowing well to whom they belong. Let's see the corresponding verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. Atma vasyamidam vishpam yat kinchit jagatyam chakat tena tyaktena bhunjita. Within this universe, the Supreme Personality of Godhead in his super soul feature is present everywhere, wherever there is animate or inanimate being. Therefore, one should only one should accept only that which is allotted to him. One should not desire to infringe upon the property of others. It is very clear that the verses are speaking about the same thing. And similarly, throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam, the philosophy is completely congruent to that of the Vedanta. In other words, the purpose of the Upanishads, the Vedanta Sutra, and Srimad Bhagavatam is one and the same. If one studies Srimad Bhagavatam carefully, he will find that all the Upanishads and the Vedanta Sutra are nicely explained therein. Srimad Bhagavatam teaches us three subjects how to re establish our eternal relationship with the Supreme Lord, how to act in that relationship, and lastly, how to achieve the highest benefit from it. Okay? So, this is, of course, very clear. The difficulty that people have in understanding it in this way is that they don't want to accept that God actually has a personality, that he's an individual person, because it's such a deeply rooted idea that the divine or the God is within us, that it is us, and that it is not some separate person. Okay, and this is a great hindrance in one's understanding of what the Vedas are actually teaching, because the principal subject matters of the Vedas and, of course, the Vedanta. Um, which is now we understood how it's related to the Vedas and the Srimad Bhagavatam is these three um, principles how we establish our relationship with the Lord, um, how we act in that relationship, and how we get the highest benefit from it. Um, so we know these by three Sanskrit terms. Okay? Um, how we um, re establish our relationship with the Lord 
It's called Sambanda. Okay, Sambanda. Sambanda is um, basically when we realize that we are spiritual. Right now, we only have theoretical knowledge that we are spiritual. When we realize it, it means that I stop seeing myself as this body. Even if I'm present in this body, I know that this is not me. Sun will cover it, but the real me is this, um, this tiny spirit soul. That is the realization of ourselves. And then we try to understand God, of course, um, because as a spirit soul, we only have an identity in relation to him. You'll see in a little while um, when Krishna states that. So we then understand more about him. Okay, We then understand that we have a relationship of service with him. And then we try to um, engage ourselves in that service. That becomes the next step. The actual engagement in service is called Abhideya. Abhideya is the second principle. And the third principle is that through that devotional service, that Abhideya, we get love of God. Right? That's the highest goal, the highest benefit, um, as Sheriff Ravar calls it. And that, um, that love of God, that stage is Prayojan. Okay, so we've got three steps. We've got Sambanda, Abhideya, and Prayojan. And they're progressive. And all the scriptures are teaching us this because when we get to that stage of Prayojan, uh, the doors to the spiritual world are open. Our bondage in this material world are over. Uh, the reason we were here to reform ourselves, to get out of here, that has been achieved. That is what the very teachings are actually helping us to do. Okay. The four Srimad Bhagavatam verses, beginning with Aham Evasam Evasri, um, that is, uh, these four verses, these seed verses, are contained in Canto 2, Chapter 9, and they are verses 33 to 36. Okay. Um, are the gist of the whole Srimad Bhagavatam. The four Srimad Bhagavatam verses, beginning with Aham Evasam Evasri, are the gist of the whole Bhagavatam. Okay. So we call these four verses Tatu Shloki. Okay, chapters 4 and Shloki verses. So these four verses, therefore, we said, will also be explaining these three principles because um, the verses are congruent with the Vedic philosophy, all saying the same thing. Krishna is not going to emanate the Vedas and then emanate the Bhagavatam and then they're going to contradict each other, right? He is the Supreme Lord who has made this creation um, to run as perfectly as possible. These three things are going to be perfectly in line as well. So let's uh, get into these four verses quickly. The first verse, which is Canto 2, chapter 9, text 33, states, uh, this is the Lord speaking to Brahma. Brahma, it is I, the personality of Godhead, who was existing before the creation, when there was nothing but myself. No is there the material nature, the cause of this creation. That which you see now is also I, the personality of Godhead, and after annihilation, what remains will also be I, the personality of Godhead. Okay? So this first verse is corresponding to Sambanda, and we can certainly see why. We said that Sambanda, we understand ourselves and we understand the Lord. So the Lord is telling us about himself. Okay? This is a theoretical knowledge about him, um, how he is the eternally existent as the truth um, from whom everything emanates from. The second verse right, is Canto 2, chapter 9, text 34. O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. Now, this second verse is also Sambanda. So how is it Sambanda? We have to look a little closely. Um, here, the Lord is saying that anything that has any value has to be in relation to him. That's us. That's the living entity. We have our value when we are in relation to the Lord, when we are servitors of him, when he relies ourselves to be servitors of him. When we are not in relation to him, then we are in contact with his illusory material energy. It's his reflection and it's in darkness, right? We are in darkness in this material world. We have no understanding of who we are. We're in ignorance. So um, this is also an explanation of the Lord's energy, the material energy as well, what it actually means. It's a reflection of him. Um, this is because it, it has no direct relation to him. Um, when we understand um, that this is an illusion, that our identity in relation to the material world is an illusion, then we're able to progress in devotional service. Right? That's the actual point of Sambandha, to get us to understand that we're not part of this world, that we actually have a relationship to Krishna. That's our real um, position. 
So then we read the next verse, um, chapter, chapter 2, chapter 9, page 35. O Brahma, please know that the universal elements enter into the cosmos and at the same time do not enter into the cosmos. Similarly, I myself also exist within everything created and at the same time I am outside everything. So this verse is not Abhideya as we would expect. It's actually Prayojan and the next verse is Abhideya. So how is this Prayojan? Well, when we see that everything is an illusion, right, at the stage of Sambandha, as we um, said in the previous verse, then we want to act um, in devotional service, which will help us then see things as they are, right? We will see Krishna as he is. To see Krishna as he is means we have to see him with love, because Krishna is love. And when we get, we get that vision through um, the process of devotional service, that's Prayoja. One who can see Krishna everywhere is never separated from him. This is the actual goal of devotional service. If we're not separated from him, if he's always with us, then wherever we are, whether it's here or whether it's in the spiritual world, um, it's all the same. Actually, this material world can be transformed for that person into the spiritual world. It means we're in the ultimate stage of liberation, and that, he said, is the goal of all the Vedic teachings. So this is Prayoja. When we can see that Krishna is within and without, that he's everywhere, that he is everything. And then the next verse is um, Canto 2, chapter 936. A person who is searching after the Supreme Absolute Truth, the personality of Godhead, must certainly search for it up to this, in all circumstances, in all space and time, and both directly and indirectly. So we can see how this is related to Abhideya. That search right, is devotional service. Through our devotional service, we're searching to be able to see the Lord in everything, to realize Him everywhere, to actually develop that love in which we can see Him in everything. Okay, so this is in a nutshell, um, these four verses. These are nicely summarized by Lord Chaitanya as follows. I, Krishna, am the supreme center for the relationships of all living entities, and knowledge of me is the supreme knowledge. The process by which a living entity can attain me is called Abhideya, my searching for the Lord through that knowledge. By it, one can attain the highest perfection of life, love of Godhead. When, attain, when one attains love of Godhead, his life becomes perfect. So um, we have to understand through the sources, like the Lord himself is speaking to Prakashananda Saraswati, like um, his um, devotees have spoken throughout the ages about this message that we don't get misled because there's such a huge scope um, for people to, to misunderstand these verses and try and, and write the Lord out of his own philosophy. That's just the problem. The explanation of these four verses is given in Srimad Bhagavatam and Lord Chaitanya gave a short description of the principles of these verses. He said that by mental speculation or academic education, no one can understand the constitutional position of the Supreme Lord, how he is situated, his transcendental qualities, his transcendental activities and his six opulences. These can only be, this, these can be understood only by the mercy of the Lord. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, one who is fortunate enough to receive the Lord's favor can understand all these explanations by the mercy of the Lord. Right? And of course, the Lord arranges through his mercy that we get the mercy of the pure devotee. Right? Through the mercy of the devotee, the spiritual master, through the acharyas, all of them um, grant us their mercy and through their mercy we get the Lord's mercy. So it's um, a very nice positive feedback. Um, this is how um, the Lord grants us the ability to understand this. Because all of us are not scholars, right? We're not scholars. We, we don't have a background in grammar or a philosophy or, or theory like those who have been exposed to this, these verses for um, countless generations. Yet the meaning is very clear, right? It's extremely clear to all of us. I don't think any one of us had a doubt from what we just read now from Prabhupada's um, wonderful translation of what the Lord is trying to say. But this is because of mercy, right? Without the, the academic background, we still get the mercy in order to be able to understand this and accept it and live by it. That's, that's the actual point. The Lord existed before the material creation. Therefore, the material ingredients, nature, and the living entities all emanated from him. And after the solution, they rest in him. When the creation is manifest, it is maintained by him. Indeed, whatever manifestation we see is but a transformation of his external energy. When the Supreme Lord withdraws his external energy, everything enters into him. In the first of the four verses, the word aham is given three times to stress that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is full with all opulences. Aham is stated three times just to chastise one who cannot understand or believe in the transcendental nature and form of the Lord. Right? So those persons who try to 
misinterpret this, right? It's, it's a bit of a tall order to be able to do that because the Lord is stating aham three times. Okay, aham, it's, it's referring to him, he, himself, right? Myself, that's what he's saying. You can't actually interpret myself in any other way, but still some kind of madness, they still try and do that. Um, he's being, the Lord's being very emphatic, stating in these verses, um, his personal, um, his personal self being responsible for all of creation, being responsible for everything, being the absolute truth. Um, it's like we remember the famous verse from the Briya Naradiya Purana that states, Hari Nam, Hari Nam, Hari Nam, is equivalent. Alone, na seva, na seva, na seva. When something is stated three times, it's very emphatic. It is, uh, it's non negotiable. It must be accepted the way it is. So the fact that the Lord is um, stating this, it must just be accepted. There's no room for interpreting it in any other way. The other important point is that no other um, devata, right? uh, no other powerful being, yaksha, raksha, rakshasha, uh, human, has ever dared state as emphatically as the Lord states that he's the source of everything. We can search through the scripture, there isn't. There may be a lot of foolish followers of other beings and personalities who try to state that they're um, chosen um, God or worshipful object, whether it's a human or whatever, it may be the supreme. But aside from their statements, which are not corroborated with scripture at all, there's no other scriptural statement where any other devata actually makes the very bold and very clear statement that the Lord makes here, that he is the source of everything, that he is the supreme Lord, that he is the supreme absolute truth, right? And that one's beauty in life is to search for him, to attain um, that love for him. The Lord possesses his internal energy, his external, marginal, and relative energies, and the manifestation of the cosmic world and the living entity. The external energy is manifested by the qualitative modes of nature, right? It means that this material world is manifested by our three, um, the three modes of nature. So we may find this a little esoteric to understand, but basically it is from these three modes that everything else is coming. Everyone and everything fits in these, everything and everyone material that is fits in these three modes. There are animals in three modes, there are colors in three modes, there are foods in three modes, there are parts of nature in three modes. For example, um, the forest and, uh, and natural surroundings are part of the mode of goodness. Um, from the modes of passion come um, the shifties, and from the modes of ignorance come the bars, clubs, brothels, things like that. So basically, the three modes are giving rise to everything. This is why we say that the three modes are the material nature. And the three modes are coloring all our personalities as well. We are actually situated in them when we are under the control of the material nature. One who can understand the nature of the living entity in the spiritual world can actually understand their diam of perfect knowledge. One cannot understand the Supreme Lord simply by seeing the material energy and the conditioned soul. But when one is in perfect knowledge, he's freed from the influence of the external energy. So that's all of us right now. We only understand ourselves in relation to this material world because we're all in the mode. We can only see what is around us. We can only feel ourselves as these bodies. We don't have any realization of us being anything else. We have to actually achieve that true knowledge, right, through the teachings of the Vedas, through the teachings of all the scriptures congruent to the Vedas, especially the Shriman Pagvatam, in order to get that Vedium, that perfect knowledge of where we're actually supposed to be situated in the spiritual energy or the spiritual world. The moon reflects the light of the sun, and without the sun, the moon cannot illuminate anything. Similarly, this material cosmic manifestation is by the reflection of the spiritual world. And this material world is, is not capable of actually doing anything on its own. It's just a reflection, but your prophet explains a perverted reflection in order to give us some kind of stability, right, so that we can actually aspire for the reality, the real world, right, the spiritual world where we actually belong. Um, this devotional service is a way in which we can do that. Um, devotional service, Abhideya, is um, our a bit, our way of reviving our eternal spiritual natures and our love for the Supreme Lord. Devotional service is um, the way that we get admitted into the spiritual world because devotional service transforms us back to our original natures, the natures of love, the natures of loving service to the Lord. This is what the entire spiritual world is about. And if we stay in the material condition, which is entirely about ourselves, right, we're completely self-centered. We can't enter into a spiritual nature that is completely centered around Krishna. It's totally incompatible. 
That's why the material world and the spiritual world are completely incompatible. Our consciousness has to transform completely. We have to become free of the mode. We have to be situated fully in devotional service. This is what um, the entire process is about. Okay. Um, if we uh, get this message from scripture, then we've understood scripture properly. We've understood the Vedas, we've understood the Vedanta, the Upanishads, the Shema Bhagavad. If we're not getting this message, it means that our knowledge is not complete or we're not actually getting the knowledge in the right spot. Okay. So we have to actually find the right path in order to um, receive the right message. When one is actually liberated from the spell of the external energy, he can understand the constitutional nature of the Supreme the Lord. Devotional service to the Lord is the only means for attaining Him. And this devotional service can be accepted by everyone and anyone in any country and under any circumstance. Devotional service is above the four principles of religion, culminating in liberation. Actually, even the preliminary processes of devotional service are transcendental to liberation, the highest subject of ordinary religion. So basically what um, is being stated here is that we must we must led to believe that the, key, the, the purposes of the Vedas are only these four goals. What are these four goals? Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. Okay, This is what is commonly been taught. This is what is prevalent. But these are practically all, um, especially when moksha is applied in the sense of attaining um, in the impersonal Brahman, right? Attaining oneness with God and not devotional service, right? That's not, um, this, this moksha is actually referring to that oneness with Brahman. So in that sense, the dharma, artha, kama, and moksha are actually all material goals. Right? The spiritual body of literature that the Vedas is is not going to be guiding us on material goals. If at all these material goals are actually stepping stones towards the real spiritual goal, right? That which is in relation to the Lord, which is in devotional service. As we said, if we don't get that message, then we haven't understood the purpose of the Vedas properly. Okay. Um, when we are getting the superficial understanding of the Vedas, right, which is sort of what's happening today, it's more like a DIY sort of blanket understanding that everybody gets to um, more or less appease. Um, uh, the mindset that you can sort of do what you want, um, follow whatever path, you still end up at the same goal, you still um, be liberated, you can um, follow any system, um, you can make it up as you go along, you can pay when you want to, how you want to, all this kind of thing. Right? It's sort of like trusting your, your academic future in a fly-by-night college. If you wouldn't do that, then you can't trust your spiritual future, right? Your um, destination after death, eternity is a long time. It's sort of like doing that, it's sort of like trusting that eternity to a sort of wishy washy philosophy or belief. And you, you can't actually attain spirituality like that. You can't attain a substantial future in the material world by trusting the wrong authorities. You can't do the same thing in, in spiritual life. And that's the point. Um, we are achieving, we were aiming for something eternal, nothing. That's what. Um, the original teachings of the Vedas were called Sanatana Dharma. So we're looking for an eternal Dharma, an eternal occupation. That's devotional service. That's the aim. Therefore, irrespective of one's caste, creed, color, country, etc., one should approach a bona fide spiritual, ma bona fide spiritual master and hear from him everything about devotional service. The real purpose of life is to revive our dormant love of God. Indeed, that is our ultimate necessity. How that love of God can be attained is explained in Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, there is theoretical knowledge and specific or realized knowledge. And perfect realized knowledge is attained when one realizes the teachings received from the spiritual master. This is a very nice summary of this chapter. Okay? All of us, respect, irrespective of our background, we're all children of the Supreme Lord. Okay? States in Srimad Bhagavatam in the fourth, sorry, Bhagavad Gita as it is in the 14th chapter, Aham, Bija, Pradaha, Pita. He's the father of everyone, okay, all life forms, all species. So he is making a plan to get all of us out of this world, right? It's not just a certain group or a certain person. He's taking responsibility for everyone, all the way to the plants, to the animals. We remember in um, Chaitanya Chaitamita, Haridas Thakur, being asked by the Lord, how will um, the, the plants and the animals be delivered in this age? The Lord's thinking of them, what to speak of all kinds of human beings, right? From all parts of the world, all parts of the universe. And Haridas Thakur says that when we go out in Sankirtan, on loud Sankirtan, all the um, living entities are here, the plants, um, the animals, they're all delivered. 
So these messages are coming by the mercy of the Lord through all the scriptures. They're being made available in every way possible through his holy name, through his teaching, right, by his, his beloved devotees. And this is because he desires all of us to get free of this world. He, he really wants all of us to be able to take the devotional service and do that. Um, so we have access to these teachings through our spiritual masters, and we need to um, take good advantage of that in the sincere spirit and help others to do the same. It will be most pleasing to the Lord. Okay. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Next week, we're going to um, begin chapter 26. Are there any questions or comments or anything I can try and clarify? Um, I know it's generally quite a bit to take in. <laughs> so, um, you'll available on WhatsApp to take any Hare Krishna Maharaji, thank you for the class. Hare Krishna Maharaji, thank you for the class. Hare Krishna Maharaji, thank, thank you for the service. Thank you all. Um, okay, so if there are no questions, we will sing our button for tonight. So, um, we are in the month of Purushottam currently. It's a very auspicious time in which we can um, progress our devotional service to the Lord, increase those activities, um, try and improve our services and maintain it after this month. So um, in particular, we're advised to glorify um, the Lord by certain um, wonderful bhajans and, um, and praises. And um, one of these, or, or some of these, um, that we advise are the bhajans in praise of Radha and Krishna. So today we're going to sing Radha Krishna Pranam Mool. This is a very beautiful bhajan by Shilanara Kandak Thakur. We will remember that he has the eternal identity as a manjari. A manjari is a very confidential servitors of Radha and Krishna in Vrindavan. At a young, very young girl. Um, and they're admitted into a uh, Radha and Krishna very um, loving past friends in a way that even the gopis uh, you might be surprised to know that. Um, and uh, Narakam Das Thakur, if I remember correctly, is Kamaka Manjari. So this meditation is in that mood. Um, we will understand a bit better when we read the translation. Um, it's very important that we always try and do that, read the translation, because we're trying to sing these bhajans and sing these um, these kirtans in the mood of love. And unless we know what we're singing, it's a bit hard to actually try and get into that mood of love. So we must always endeavor to read the translation um, whenever we are singing any of these wonderful songs and compositions by our Charya. Radha Krishna Pranamora Yukala Kisho Radha Krishna Pranamora Yugala Kisho Jivane Marane Gati Arunahi Moha Jivane Marane Gati Arunahi Moha Radha Krishna Prani Mora Yugala Kisho Radha Krishna Pranamora Mora Yugala Kisho Kalindira Kule Nte Sabdandera Vanha Kalindira Kule Kili Sadandera Vanha Ratana Vedira Upa O Savo to Jana Ratana Vedira Upa O Savo to Jana 
राधा कृष्ण प्राण मोरा युगाशिशो राधा कृष्ण प्राण मोरा युगाशिशो चंद्र राधा कृष्ण प्राण मोरा किशो राधा कृष्ण प्राण मोरा युगा किशो दतिया मला तीर मला शिवो दो हर गले दतिया मला तीर मला शिवो दो हर गले आधारे तुलिया दिवो पूरा तांबुले आधारे तुलिया दिवो कर्पूरा तांबुले राधा कृष्ण प्राण मोरा युगला किशो राधा कृष्ण प्राण मोरा युगला किशो ललिता विशाखा आदि जत साक्षी बृंदा ललिता विशाखा आदि जत साक्षी बृंदा आज्ञा कोरी वो सेवा शरणार बिंदा आज्ञा कोरी वो सेवा शरणार बिंदा राधा कृष्ण प्राण मोरा चिकला किशो राधा कृष्ण प्राण मोरा चिकला किशो श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु सासेर अनुदासा श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु सासेर अनुदासा सेवा विलास को रे नरोतम दास सेवा आविलास को रे रोतम दास राध कृष्ण प्राण मोरा युगला किशो राध कृष्ण प्राण मोरा युगला किशो राध कृष्ण प्राण मोरा युगला किशो राधा कृष्ण प्राण मोरा कृष्ण श्री श्री राधा एंड कृष्ण इज माई लाइफ एंड सोल इन लाइफ और डेथ आई हैव नो अदर रिफ्यूज इन द फॉरेस्ट ऑफ स्मॉल कदम्बर ट्रीज इन द बैंक ऑफ द यमुना आई विल सी द डिवाइन कपल इन द ग्रोन मेड ऑफ ब्रिलियन जो आई विल अनोइंट द जास एंड फेयर फॉर्म्स विद Sandalwood leaves scented with chuya, and I will fan them with the chamara wood. Oh, when will I behold the moonlight face? After stringing together garlands of malachi flowers, I will place them around their necks, and I will offer sambula scented camphor to their lotus mouth. With the permission of all the sakis headed by Lalita and Vishaka, I will serve the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna. Narottam Das, the servant of the servant of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Chaitanya Prabhu. Long for the service to the divine couple. So this is an important point that Narayan Das Thakur made to the end that we must be the servants of the servants of Lord Chaitanya to get um, the association and service of Radha and Krishna. So the servants of the servants of Lord Chaitanya, everyone, all devotees everywhere, uh, certainly our spiritual masters, um, we must endeavor first to be the servants of all of them, um, of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and then we can endeavor to be the servants of Radha and Krishna. Thank you.
So thank you again so much, everyone, and please join us next week as we continue with speaking about the Daniel. Hare Krishna, everyone.